Hello, my name is Dr. Karen Ann Lonsdale and this video is about the basics of Recorder, Yamaha 5 and Flute. This presentation is for Pustaka Negri Sarawak, the Sarawak State Library in Malaysia and thank you so much for the opportunity to do this video. Okay this screen shows the three instruments that we will be learning today. The one on the left is the descant or soprano recorder in C. This particular one is made out of plastic but you might have a wooden recorder. The one at the top is the Yamaha 5. It's also made of plastic and definitely not made of plastic is the one at the bottom. It's a silver western concert flute. A little bit about me. I hold a Doctor of Musical Arts degree from Griffith University which is here in Brisbane. We're in winter here so it's a little bit chilly uh, we don't have a really harsh winter but it's probably a lot more chilly than it is where you are there in Malaysia uh, depending on where you are of course if you're up in the mountains it might be cool but um, if you're watching from uh, most parts of Malaysia it's probably very warm there all right uh, I was a senior lecturer at University Pandidikan Sultan Idris in Malaysia from 2012 to 2018. For those who don't speak Malay, that means Sultan Idris Education University. Um, I'm a professional flute player and I have also taught flute players of all levels from young primary school students, the youngest I think was six, um, through to secondary school, uh, both undergraduate and postgraduate university students and also adult amateur players. I don't want to spend too much time talking about me so if you'd like to read more about my work you can go to my website www uh, dot Karen and Lonsdale dot com. Okay, so this class is intended for absolute beginners on these instruments. So you don't have to have played um, uh, flute recorder or Yamaha 5 before or any other instruments. So uh, it will suit you if you are a total beginner and we're going to start by learning to read and play three notes G, A and B on the soprano recorder, the Yamaha 5 and flute which are very similar and uh, we'll be learning different note values so we'll be learning semi-briefs which are also known as whole notes in the USA and minims which are known as half notes, crotchets which are known as quarter notes and quavers which are known as eighth notes. So we'll be playing a few three note tunes. We will be looking at the different physical positions and holds for the three different instruments and we'll also be talking about um, some of the basics of instrument maintenance so how to clean the instruments and importantly we'll be talking about different types of flutes and their features and which instrument to buy and by that I don't mean which brand to buy um, speaking about things like should I buy a C foot joint or a B foot joint, should I buy an open hole flute or a close hole flute and so on. So we're talking about the different different types of um, instruments 
and which type of instrument might suit different players. Okay, so let's have just a general look at the similarities and differences between the recorder Yamaha Fife and flute. So the fingerings are very similar, but they're not identical. The holding position is different. So a recorder is vertically held, whereas uh, the Yamaha Fife and Flute are both horizontally held. And I'll play the same note on flute so you can hear it. Whew, the flute is cold because it's chilly here. All right, so the weight of the instruments uh, is quite different. So the recorder is uh, very light and so is the Yamaha Fife. Whereas uh, the flute, this one's made of sterling silver and it's also got a B foot joint. So it's slightly longer than uh, a, a standard beginner flute. This is a professional flute and uh, it's a lot heavier than, than the plastic instruments. Some flutes are made with uh, platinum. It's a very expensive metal. It sounds amazing but it's also quite heavy. And then, of course, we also have other metals like gold. But a standard beginner flute would generally be made out of, um, uh, these days, uh, silver plating. Um, but we'll talk more about that uh, a little further on during the presentation. Um, we use a different air pressure as well for the different instruments. So with the recorder, we use a fairly low pressure. Uh, same with the Yamaha 5, but we tend to use um, a wider range of air pressure and much higher air pressure with the flute. If you played with the same air pressure um that you do on flute, on a recorder, the recorder will squeak. So we have to um, be able to adjust when we change instruments. Um, I think it's important to note here that when we play the recorder, we're covering up the mouthpiece with our embouchure, our mouth and blowing straight down into the instrument. Whereas the Yamaha Fife um, and the flute needs to be blown across. So the S stream is blown across the instrument. So there's a split of air and we're aiming for roughly around this outer wall. If we blow too much down into the flute, this is what will happen. We're not going to get a, a clear sound. And on the Yamaha 5, there are these, uh, you might be able to see there, there's a slight raised lip plate which helps to direct the airstream. It's quite helpful for beginners, but you don't need that on a professional instrument. Okay, so let's talk about um, setting up the instrument because uh, it's important that they are set up um, correctly otherwise you can um, have problems such as having to stretch too far or um, not being able to make the optimal sound and so on so it's really important that the instruments are set up correctly all right, so the different parts of the recorder, we have a head joint and that cream piece here, that is the mouthpiece you blow into there. This section here is the, the window. We're not going to go too much into technicalities. I'm just going to keep it really simple today. Um, this is the body of the recorder and these are the tone holes and then this piece here is the foot joint okay 
So when we line this up, the tone holes need to be in line with this window here. And then the foot joint can be adjusted. So let's say, for example, a child plays and they've got a shorter pinky finger than I do, then they will probably uh, adjust that uh, to a different place. So you can just adjust that uh, foot joint to where it feels comfortable. But it's important that the, uh, the body is aligned so that tone holes are in the same alignment as say where that brand name is there to produce uh, the best possible sound and um, to make sure it's comfortable to play. Okay, the Yamaha 5 is built in just two sections. So it has a head joint, so that's it there and a body and similar to the recorder it has tone holes it doesn't have any any keys so it does have some limitations technically but it's a really terrific instrument for children to play um, that's not to say that adults can't can't play it i've seen lots of videos in fact on youtube of adults playing this five it's a great instrument to start with. It's very inexpensive. Uh, here in Australia, they cost something like between 22 to 26 or 27 Australian dollars. And um, that's a, um, not much money to pay to learn a, a new instrument. So you don't have to outlay a lot of money in the beginning. So this is also really great for um, for example, if you have a young child who says, I want to play flute, I want to play flute, and they might be, say, eight years old, you don't want to spend a $1,000 uh, or however many ring it, 3,000 ring it or something, on, um, on a silver flute or a silver-plated flute. So this is a wonderful option. Um, it's inexpensive. You can see if they're going to practice and it's nice and comfortable to to hold. So, um, yes, I can strongly recommend this little flute, uh, especially for young children. OK, so let's have a look at the fingerings here. We're going to learn G, A and B, which are almost identical on recorder uh, Yamaha 5 and flute. There's just some slight differences which we'll discuss. So I've prepared these fingering charts. The top part there where you see those black filled in circles, that's the left hand. Then you'll see a line and that separates the left hand from the right hand. So those circles at the bottom, which haven't been filled in, that's the right hand. So it's important that we put the left hand at the top and the right hand at the bottom. Okay, so as you can see with the G, we've got the thumb and then one, two, three tone holes covered. Okay. And we just blow gently through the mouthpiece and that's G. Okay, so then we lift up one finger in the left hand. So we've still got our thumb on plus uh, two fingers down. That's A. And then we've got a thumb and first finger. And there we have it. B. Easy. Okay, as you can see with the Yamaha 5, it's exactly the same in the left hand, but we've got this added um, right hand pinky finger. Okay, that's important for balancing the instrument and uh, it's uh, similar to the flute where we also have to use the right hand
pinky finger. So the left hand is exactly the same. So we've got the thumb and then we've got B, A and G. Okay, now with the five, we blow across the instrument. Now it's important that we direct the air well. If we blow too much into the hole, we're going to get this kind of muffled sound. If we try to cover it too much, kind of get, a, get an airy sound. If we blow too much over, over the top, we're going to get that air sound. So we have to focus a scented air stream. So if you can imagine as if you're blowing through a straw, blow the air stream through uh, one scented air stream. So we don't want the air to be spread out like that. Blow in one direct line. And we want to blow across the top of the instrument. Now let's just talk about the placement. So we've got this uh, outer edge of the embouchure hole and that needs to meet with um, where the, where the um, skin on your chin meets the outline, the lower um, outline of your bottom lip. That's about where we put that. And you'll see on the Yamaha Fife and also flute, there's a wide part of what we call the lip plate. It's probably a little bit hard to see that there, but it will be much more clear. There we go. You see that? That's wide. That wide part goes against the chin. And this um, thinner part goes towards the outside. So once we've got that on the chin, that just rests in this groove here in your chin. So we blow uh, down and across. If you need to, you can stop the video and then um, see if you can um, experiment and uh, get a beautiful sound but the main thing again is that we don't want the air to be spread out like that uh, we need to direct it in one focused centered line and I find the, um, I find it helpful to think of that straw if you were to blow through a straw you'd have that air contained in one in the one tube All right, so have a try of that. Okay, let's talk about the different parts of the uh, standard flute. Okay, at the top, you'll see the head joint. Sometimes we also call it the head. Okay, and um, this can be made out of different types of metals. So you, sometimes you might see people playing with a gold head joint, a silver head joint, uh, a platinum head joint, or a mix of those. So, um, for example, you can have um, one metal on the lip plate. So you might have a gold lip plate, for example, or a platinum lip plate, and then the rest of the head joint is in silver. So there's all sorts of possibilities. But when we're starting out, typically we play on a silver plated flute, silver plated head joint. Uh, but these head joints, um, as you become more advanced, um, perhaps if you become a professional player later, you might end up with a head joint which is uh, very expensive. They can range from, um, you know, some, somewhere around $3,000 and upwards from there. They can become very, very expensive. All right, so the next um, piece there is the body. Now you might notice that my flute has open holes. 
student flutes come with uh, closed holes, but actually uh, it's becoming more common for student flutes to be available with open holes as well. And we'll talk about that uh, later, whether you should have closed holes or open holes. A lot of teachers recommend closed holes for student flutes. I actually think it's great to start students with um, open holes, but it may be slightly more expensive to do it that way. Okay, now down the bottom, you'll see the foot joint okay so there's what we call a c foot joint so this foot joint plays down to uh, the note middle c and the one next to it which says uh, foot joint b b foot joint uh, it plays down to the b one semitone below middle c okay Let's talk about how to line those up. All right. Oops. Okay. So with a flute assembly, it's important to align the flute correctly to ensure that you can produce a sound with optimal tone quality intonation which is tuning and also play with technical efficiency so the center of the embouchure hole should be in a direct line with the center of the larger keys um, so here you can see that pink arrow points to the first key uh, and it should be roughly in uh, in line with the center of those keys. Okay. So uh, you can hold it up and have a look and you can see very clearly whether that lines up. Okay, now with a foot joint, let's go on to the next screen. So have a look there carefully. Notice that it's not the rods. The, see those long rods? This is what we call a rod, these long pieces here. Okay, we don't line the rods up together. So the rod of the foot joint should line up with the about the center of this key on the body now this can be adjusted slightly depending on the size of your hands and fingers so you might find it a little bit more comfortable to move that uh, foot joint um, slightly further away or slightly closer depending on the size of your hand and that's absolutely okay okay the flute is not the easiest instrument in the world to hold um, and so we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about the different balance points okay so the flute uh, has most of its weight on one side so you, you can see all the keys most of the keys and the rods are on one side of the flute and then on the other side there is just tubing so what happens is the flute has a tendency then to roll backwards because of that weight so because of its length and um, the distribution of the weight of of the keys and the rods and so on um, we've got different balance points now some people will talk about three different balance points but i'm going to show you uh, four different balance points for um, how we hold this instrument without it rolling backwards just give me 
just had to have a little cough there <laughs> okay so the first balance point so when we rest the flute on the lowest part of the left hand index finger so the second finger where the knuckle is okay so you can feel that uh, indentation there where the knuckle is so we put the flute um, we rest the flute there on that knuckle and then we slide the um, hand down we don't use this first key at all oh, can you see that there we don't ever press that key so we use this one here press that there and then we skip this one here if you can see that so we go straight to the next one for the a and then the g a second balance point is uh, the lip plate on the chin and again we have that wider lip plate there the widest part of the lip plate goes against the chin the right thumb supports the weight of the flute so the right thumb is placed so you see at the end of the body you have three uh, the last three keys so the right thumb is um held so i'm just trying to get it right <laughs> with the camera view there is um if you count up three keys from the end of the body we place the thumb about under that key which is known as the f key so the right thumb supports the weight of the flute and then we have the right hand pinky which presses this particular key for most notes okay so when we hold it here's the g with the three fingers a b it takes a while to um, to learn how to hold the flute and that's one of the reasons why for little children I suggest uh, starting out with the Yamaha 5 because it's much easier to hold okay so with our head and shoulder um, aim to keep the head as close to neutral position as uh, possible in other words we don't want to be um, dropping our head to the side like this or forwards um and also avoid lifting the shoulders so little kids in particular when they first start picking up the flute you'll often see them putting their flute on their shoulder and then um, lifting up the shoulder but it's very important that we just lift the flute directly to our chin without um, lifting up the shoulder and I wanted to just clarify that while the head is in a fairly neutral position, it does need to be just slightly um, pointed to the left. And um, there we go. Let's go on to the next bit. Okay, so this word embouchure again. So we're talking about the lips and the mouth and the shape that is formed when we play our flutes so the terms used for other wind instruments as well for example the oboe and the clarinet and each one of those instruments has a different formation of the lips and mouth and that's what we call embouchure okay so just to revise the wider part of the lip plate is placed against the chin now we don't want to press too hard okay so minimal pressure um, and with the lips back in the old days uh, they used to really pull those lips back um, but that can result in quite a tense um, sound but also quite a sore um, sore facial muscles so we 
I would recommend that you play with uh, more natural um, face uh, position so that you're not pulling back with the, with the corner of, of your of your lips I sometimes explain to students um, it's like if you have a piece of paper on your hand and then you blow it off like that so this is just a small piece of paper it's uh, Australian consumer warranty information but whatever it is a, a little piece of paper put it on your hand and blow and that's about um, how we blow the flute as well with a nice natural uh, forward uh, lip position okay so again if we just take the head joint off sometimes it's quite helpful just to play with the head joint especially for beginners so we've got that wide lip plate wide part of the lip plate and then the more narrow part it's the wide part which you put against your chin so you can see here where my uh, skin of my chin meets the pink part of my lip that outline there that's about where this outer edge of the embouchure hole will meet my lip so again we need to blow a scented airstream across the top of the embouchure hole and we need to direct the air towards the opposite wall of the tube so again if we blow the air downwards too much we're going to get a, not a very nice sound if we blow uh, too much over the top all right if the air streams if you're blowing upwards too much you're going to get a very airy sound like this okay so what we're aiming to do is remember that straw so we're blowing the airstream in a centered um, uh, stream we can actually also cover the end of the head joint and make a lower sound we're going to make some funny sounds by sliding in there as well play lots of games like that just with the head joint some teachers like to spend quite a bit of time on the head joint and that can be helpful for learning um, uh, different rhythms but I find that students want to want to play very quickly so I do a few exercises on the head joint and then get straight on to playing okay let's just talk about the fingers this is all uh, important for when we first start playing um, the fingers should be lightly curved so something like this uh, there's a picture there for you the right thumb is under the F key so that's that third one up um, from the end um, we're going to make sure the thumb isn't doing this this is bad uh, or this kind of thing okay I know that's uh, especially when you first pick up a flute there's um, it's tempting to do that but it's better to have the right thumb a little bit further back on the tube um, and with the left hand we make uh, like a C shape and remember rest the instrument on the knuckle slide it down and we keep the wrist in a neutral position so again we don't want to be raising our wrists or raising our elbows keep it in a neutral position uh, not flexed or extended and the weight of the flute should be on the right thumb now this is a lot um, if you're just picking up a flute for the first time this is a lot to take in so uh, don't worry if you can't get it first time because as I said the flute's quite difficult to hold and it takes a while to get used to all of these things so we keep our fingers uh, fairly close to the keys 
and um, the right hand little finger is down for most notes sometimes people um, incorrectly leave that one off but for most notes uh, we have this little finger down and um, it's really important that we don't unnecessarily raise wrists and elbows and, and shoulders so that's the view from um, from the right hand side so you'll notice that the fingers are nicely curved and that the right thumb is supporting the weight of the flute and you'll see also that the lip plate the wider part of the lip plate is against the chin okay here's a view of the front so you'll notice that the fingers are just gently touching the top of the keys have a look at the alignment of the foot joint so you can see the rod there it's aligned with the center of the keys of the body and if you're going to stand I won't stand today um, this is me playing in a wig if you're wondering why my hair looks so different uh, I was playing in a wig <laughs> uh, this is for a cabaret show so we did some dancing and singing and playing flute as well so the feet should be roughly about shoulder width apart if you're going to stand up um, remember keep your shoulders down the left foot is slightly forward but don't twist the spine and remember to bring the flute to your face rather than bringing your head down to the flute okay so have your neutral head position slightly turn to the left and then lift your um, okay so I realize that could be confusing about the the neutral head position what I mean by that is not um, dropping your head or um, letting the head go back too far we want it to be in a, a fairly uh, a comfortable position just slightly turn to the left and then bring the flute to your face okay if you're going to play in a band or ensemble make sure that you have enough room between the players so that you can hold your flute straight out to the side and not hanging down so we don't want this kind of thing and you see that a lot with school children sitting like this okay it's really important that you um, keep your neck in a, in, a, in a safe and healthy alignment if you play like this for a long time you might end up having a very sore neck and and shoulders okay so let's talk about some basic music theory okay so we'll start off with the staff or the stave which consists of five lines and four spaces on the first line is the note E so you'll notice that the line goes straight through the middle of the note so that line is E the second line is the note G in treble clef that is and flutes play in treble clef and the third line in the treble clef is B the fourth line is D and the fifth line is F some people like to remember that by saying a phrase like every good boy deserves fruit or every good boy deserves fudge or um, I really like the phrase elephants great big dirty feet and you might have a special phrase in Malay or your language that um, makes it easier to remember but um, those are some common ones 
in English. Okay, and then let's have a look at the spaces. So the notes in the four spaces are F, uh, second space is A, the third space is C, and the fourth space is E. And that spells out the word face in English. Okay, so uh, we've already done this before on uh, Yamaha 5 and recorder. So the fingerings are the same and I'm having a little bit of trouble with my browser when I'm, I'm recording this presentation in Zoom and uh, my mouse is um, not, not showing so <laughs> um, that's why I'm having a little bit of trouble moving this, uh, moving this video. Oh, there we go. I got it. Yay. All right. So um, it's a little bit hard. I can't see the cursor. That's, that's why I didn't do that before. Oopsie. Let's go back. How do we go back? Okay. Well, let's let's move on um, because it's probably a bit easier to see it here. Um, so we've got the G and you'll notice that this diagram is a little bit more complex than the one for recorder and five. So we've still got in the left hand the first three keys, B, A, and G down, and then the thumb. Plus we have the pinky finger in the right hand. All right. So we've got a semi-brief. So in um, the UK and Australia and also in Malaysia when I was there, we called this... Um, note that you see in the first bar a semi brief and in common time in 4-4 four, four time um, uh, we play this for four counts and let me just see if I can get back on no I'm, I'm not sure how to get back in that in the in the um, presentation but the top number of the time signature, you see 4-4 four, four down there. Uh, the top number means the number of beats per bar. So there are four beats per bar. And the bottom number means that those beats are crotchets. Okay, so crotchets have one count each. So we hold a semi-brief for four counts. And then we have a bar line that separates um, the bars into these four counts. And then we have a semi brief rest, so that little block um, symbol there, uh, that, that little black blocked out line, that is uh, semi brief rest. And then we have another semi brief. And that squiggly line at the beginning of the music is called a treble clef. And uh, we use that for the high instruments such as uh, recorder, Yamaha 5 and flute. So we'll play. We hold that for four counts. So it'll be one, two, three, four. Rest, two, three, four. Rest, two, three, four. Four. Now you have a look at the end of the line. There are two lines going down and two uh, dots. That's what we call a repeat sign. So it means we, we repeat the whole thing again. So let's start from the beginning and then we'll do the repeat as well. So here we go. One, two, three, four. Rest, two, three, four. Rest to repeat and rest two, three, four. Rest two, three, four. There we go. So that's G. So you've learnt uh, how to count a semi brief 
or a whole note in the um, in America they will call this a whole note so it's helpful to know both names because um, later on let's say you're working with uh, American musicians or playing with an American conductor at some stage they might be more likely to use the term whole note whereas if you're working from uh, with someone or playing with someone from the UK or Australia they might be more likely to, to say semi-brief okay so it is quite helpful to know both of them okay so the same as the Yamaha 5 and recorder remember the second space is a remember face f a c e the the names of the spaces on the staff all right so the second space up is a so again we're going to play for for four counts of the semi brief or whole note rest of four play for four rest of four and then we're going to repeat that passage again so with a fingering it's first finger down to the second finger down and then the thumb and also the right hand pinky are down ready one two three four rest two three four rest two three repeat rest two three four rest two three four okay and then we've got B this is B uh, natural so we've had G natural A natural and now B natural again uh, very similar to the Yamaha 5 so we've got our thumb down in the left hand and also the first finger and then the pinky finger in the right hand so let's try this one rest two three four rest two three four rest two three four rest two three four so there you go the G A and B okay now we're going to learn minims uh, also known as half notes in America and uh, oh, we could learn minims and half note rest but actually we don't have any rests in there <laughs> so um, just ignore that um, so these are two counts each in common time okay so let's talk about what common time is common time is just referring to the time signature 4-4 four, four. so remember the top number means how many beats there are in a bar so there are four beats in a bar the bottom number means what type of beats they are and if it's a four that means they're crotchet beats so the minims we count two beats each so it's one two three four let's just clap it one two three four 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 okay so I'm just going to play this for you one so we've got let's go over the names of the notes so remember the second line is G so remember every good boy deserves fruit or elephants great big dirty feet so the second line is a G the second space is a the third line is B okay ready one two three four and no repeat 
repeat on this one. How did you go? Let's just try that one on recorder. You might be getting a little bit tired. So let's try the same thing on recorder. Two, three, four. Remember with the recorder you don't need to have the little finger down for those notes. And on Yamaha 5, it's the same as the flute, so we've got to have the pinky finger down in the right hand. Two, three, four. Now, if you're having trouble, if you're playing along now and you've only just picked up uh, a Yamaha 5 for the first time, uh, you might find that sometimes you're getting an airy sound. So it would be best to maybe just uh, turn off the video and then just uh, try and get your optimal sound because there's no point practicing with an airy sound like this. <laughs> Okay, so something's going on. If you're getting a sound like that, it's probably because um, the air is spreading too much and you're blowing the airstream upwards too much. So what we want to do is to blow uh, across the instrument. Remember, we're blowing in one centered, um, one focused um, airstream or line. And then we're aiming slightly downwards and across. You might find also that you need to breathe more often because you're not used to holding um, the air. And that's perfectly normal, especially for young children. All right. Okay. Um, G and A. So we're going to be doing crotchets now and these are worth one count each in common time or 4-4. Four, four. Remember again the top number means how many beats are in the bar, four beats in the bar. The bottom number means crotchets. So you'll notice in each bar here there are four crotchets. Then there's a line that's called a bar line. Then we've got another group of four crotchets, another group of four crotchets, and another group of four crotchets. So the notes here, remember the second line, every good boy deserves fruit. The second line is G. So uh, G is in the first bar, and then in the second bar, we've got A, which is in the second space. So here we go, one, two, three, four. one on recorder as well. One, two, three, four. Okay, and then flute. And one thing I should have mentioned and that is about tonguing or articulation. So we use the tip of the tongue and we can say two without actually um, vocalizing that two, 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 or do 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 but without actually vocalizing that okay so the tongue should not come between uh, the lips when we do this it's important that in the same way if you say the word to I'm going to the shop the tip of your tongue meets um, that area which is just above 
your top teeth at the back <laughs> just beneath the the teeth ridge so two 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 or do 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 so let's try that this is a two <laughs> We can go for a, a do. Let's try both. See which one you like best. Okay, now we're going to learn quavers. Or these are called eighth notes and they have a half account each in common time so in a bar of four four we have eight quavers so let's just start off with a recorder so we count this one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four There you go. All right, so we do the same thing on Yamaha 5. Just B A G A B A G. One and two and three and four and. Good. Okay, and now on flute. One and two and three and four and and at the end we have two lines, a double bar line, which means we're at the end of the piece or the end of a section. Okay. Yeah, we're just going to try and find this cursor again. All right. So here we've got uh, a piece again using A, G and B. So I heard this is quite common in Malaysia. Among the Tamil community. So it starts on A. There's G, A, B and we're using quavers and crotchets combined and at the end remember that sign so we've got the two lines going down and the two dots and that means uh repeat so we're going to play those whole four bars and then we're going to go back to the beginning and play those four bars again so Let's go. One, two, three, four. Let's try that on Yamaha 5. We get our fingers ready. There's our B, our A, G, our thumb supports the instrument, and then our, our pinky is down in uh, on 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 the right hand of the instrument. So starting with A. Two, three, four. Quite easy. All right, 
now we take the the flute. Let's try it on there. So it's the same fingering, but we've got to remember to support the weight of the flute with our right thumb. Our pinky is on this small key. Okay, and we curve our fingers lightly. I'm just going to have another drink. We curve our fingers lightly. Make sure they're not hanging over the edge of the keys like that. Keep them lightly rested and lightly curved onto the center of the keys. Oops, just had a bit of a coughing fit there. <laughs> just went to get a drink of water. I've come back again now. So let's just try that again. One, two, three, four. So there's another little piece with three notes. Okay, finally we've got to the section about flute maintenance and looking after your flute. Actually, if you have a look at that picture there, you'll see that it's a closed hole model. So it's a covered hole model, all right, which is different to my flute, which is an open hole model, okay? Mostly the closed hole models are played by uh, children, but I do know some professional players who prefer to play with a closed hole. Sometimes the doublers um, like to use a closed hole model. So people who are doing jazz doubling, if they play saxophone and clarinet, sometimes they like to, uh, to buy a closed hole flute. Um, but most specialists, uh, professional flute players, will choose an open hole model. When you're a beginner, uh, it's quite normal to play with a closed hole. Um, but for keeping your hands in that curved position, I would actually recommend uh, starting with an, an open hole flute from the very beginning. It could be a little bit more expensive. Um, uh, I, uh, pricing is different in, in different parts of the world, wherever you are. But um, I would recommend if you can afford to, to start straight away with the open hole model. The open hole flutes do come with little plastic plugs. So you can actually plug them into the holes um, and 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 make it like a closed hole flute if you need to. Okay, so after each time you play, you use a plain lint and fluff free cloth. That's very very important. Otherwise, you you can get bits of fluff stuck in the um, in the tube we don't want that to happen so you can use for example uh, a men's handkerchief like this and thread a small part of it through the hole of the cleaning rod so the cleaning rods for the recorder and fife and uh, flute are quite similar so you've got um, that's your cleaning rod and you've got this um, space at the top where you can thread through your cloth. Okay, so you just put through the cloth. And what I recommend you do is just cover the top of the cleaning rod um, with the cloth so that you, there's no worries about scratching the inside of the instrument. So you wrap the cloth around 
the cleaning rod um, and don't bunch it up like this because if you bunch it up it could get stuck inside the instrument and little children are <laughs> well known for doing things like that uh, and once it gets stuck in there it can be very very difficult to remove and there's a possibility that when you do try to move it that it will rip the pads now flute is a very expensive instrument to buy so i suggest that you learn how to um, cover the rod in a way that's um, going to be able to move inside the flute without it getting stuck inside okay which could damage the instrument all right so with the flute you can uh, put the cleaning rod right through the instrument try not to touch the keys when you're doing that so you can touch the rod and the body try not to touch the keys and just pull it straight through you can look through there and see if it's dry and then you put the um, the flute straight back in its case okay I don't think it's a great idea to leave the flute lying around um, accidents can happen uh, I know I've got very small um, nephews who come around from time to time and I wouldn't leave anything out for them the flute would definitely get damaged um, so just be careful with that I suggest you put the flute away every time okay with the body just put the cleaning rod through you can either do it like that from one end at a time so it should come out as easily as that if it's not coming out that easily you've probably bunched up the material too much or you can just push it straight through pull it through okay and again just check to see that the moisture's all gone and uh, finally the head joint or well, you can do it in whichever you audio you wish I guess um, I quite often do the head joint first so we just put the cleaning rod into the flute head joint and then make sure that we dry out the inside um, new flutes will often come with um, a piece of uh, white gauze which you can use to dry out the inside of the flute eventually that's going to become um, uh, smelly and uh, you'll have to throw it away uh, after some time it could, could be a few months and then you can get just use men's hankies and you can be washed up obviously okay so for the outside most flutes will also come with a polishing cloth now I don't know what I've done with mine but you can just polish the outside of the flute it's a, it's a much more soft cloth uh, and you can rub the fingerprints off um, off the outside of the instrument but just take care not to um, not to be uh, well you need to be gentle and make sure you don't damage any of the small springs okay um, so some people use cigarette paper or powder on the pads but this is not recommended um, so sometimes the pads can get sticky so especially if you're traveling between countries which of course at the moment we're not doing much of that but um, if you travel from a cold place to a hot place or uh, moving between air conditioning and and outside sometimes the, the the pads can become sticky it's better just to try to um, let the flute get used to that because if you try to stick paper in there and drag it out you might actually rip the pad so that's not good at all and then the pads are quite expensive to replace and yeah so unless you really have to don't stick anything like that under the pads 
Um, try to avoid touching the keys when you're cleaning. And the other thing which is really important is um, uh, sometimes we can put things like mousse and gel and hairspray and that sort of thing in our hair. At the moment I don't have any in my hair. But those products, uh, if you touch your hair and then touch your instruments, that sticky stuff is going to get on the flute and it can be quite uncomfortable and probably not really great for the flute either. So um, just be very, very careful about the products that you put in your hair and um, same thing with, with food and everything like that. Make sure you wash your hands before you play and um, um, keep, keep the flute as clean as possible. Okay, so um, All Us is the brand of recording that I have, but um, you might have a Yamaha or, an, or another brand, and that's fine. Actually, my other recorder is a Yamaha, and um, they usually come with a cleaning rod, so they look something like this. Okay, so a smaller one. So you do the same thing with the recorder. And um, the, rear, the rod has a small oblong um, slot like the flute in one end, which you'll insert a small lint-free piece of cloth. Use it once a day when the recorder is being played. Um, the recorder, because it is plastic, um, can also be disinfected and you can actually clean it in dishwashing liquid and warm water once a week so um, and the the Yamaha 5 just follow the instructions that come with the instrument and um, actually the Yamaha 5 also comes with the oh you can buy separately um, the Yamaha 5 book which is full of lots and lots of tunes for the 5 so follow the instructions that you have in there but again it's quite similar to the flute Okay, um, if you have a wooden recorder, follow the advice at these links. I've given you different links um, that you can read up on because that's uh, uh, obviously quite different and um, more involved and um, you want to make sure that you look after your wooden instrument very well because they're very precious and uh, expensive. So do make sure you follow the, the advice given by those specialists about your wooden recorder. Okay, so um, when people come to learn flute or the parents are wanting to buy a flute for their child, they often ask, which flute should I buy? And some people are quite sort of... Um, obsessed with brands okay which brand should I buy but actually what what you need to be looking at is the different features so let's go through the different types of features okay so a standard Western concert flute has a straight head joint uh, body and foot joint. This type of flute is good for adults and uh, children from about 9 to 11 years of age and up. Okay, so then you have the option of a curved flute. So this little girl in this photo is playing a curved flute. You can just see that um, on the left side of her face, the, the curve. It, and it has a straight body and foot joint. A D foot flute has a curved head joint and a straight body, but it doesn't have a foot joint. So it's a little bit like the Yamaha 5 in that sense that it doesn't have the extra keys, um, the C sharp and C or B keys in the foot joint. And then we have a waveline flute, which I'll show you soon, which has a short straight head joint, a loop, and then a body which shortens the length of the, of the flute, which can be quite useful for beginners. Okay, so 
The top flute there that you're looking at is a D foot. So it's got a curved head joint and um, a, just that uh, small a key for the pinky finger, the E flat key or D sharp key. Um, and then the next one is a curved flute with a C foot joint. And then you've got a beginner flute with a standard head joint and a standard body and a C foot joint. So you can see the two keys on the foot joint. And finally, that's my flute at the bottom there. Then you have uh, um, three keys on the foot joint. So that's a B foot joint. So you can see that the, that the length is very different between those instruments. So you can see for a child that the curved flutes uh, could have uh, quite an advantage. The disadvantage is that at some point you're going to have to upgrade. So let's say you have a seven year old child who wants to play a flute that those first two options could be really good but at some point you're going to have to upgrade so my preferred option because the curve flute actually the curve adds another angle which can make the flute um, difficult to balance so you've got to get that angle of the curve right which can can be a bit tricky um, and so I tend to recommend buying a standard flute and then alternating with recorder or Yamaha 5. So I've particularly been using Yamaha 5 in my lessons. Uh, so I had, for example, um, a student who came to me when she was eight years old and she started out on a normal um, C foot student flute and she was tiring very quickly because she's quite small and so I suggested that she get a Yamaha flute and she loved that and she played the Yamaha Fife for a while and then she started to alternate between uh, Yamaha Fife and flute and over a period of about 12 months she became much more um, physically strong and now she's playing mainly on the silver flute so for me that's actually for a young child i think it's a much better option uh, to start on yamaha 5 because it's cheaper it's smaller it's lighter um, and you don't have the big outlay of cost of buying a curved flute and then uh, having to upgrade later on. Some models come with the curved head joint and the, and the straight head joint, so you get two head joints with it, but that's also more expensive. So it's a much more expensive way to do that than to buy a standard flute as well as a Yamaha 5. That's just my um, my opinion and um, something something worth considering. If money's not a problem, then you might want to try, um, for example, having a curved and a straight straight flute. But I th I think actually it's not necessary. I think you can achieve a lot, you can learn a lot by playing a recorder and Yamaha 5 uh, and learning the notes on those instruments and swapping over because the fingerings are so similar. So up the top right there is what a curved head joint looks like. And actually these come on the, on the larger flutes as well, so alto flute and bass flute. You can buy those with curved head joints. Um, generally speaking, I prefer straight head joints, even though it means there's a bigger stretch to play. I'm not a big fan of the curved head joints, to be honest. Uh, I don't mind them, and sometimes I play on them, 
but um, I much prefer the straight head joints. Okay, now here's a little interesting flute. Um, this one's by Azumi, but I believe other companies are making them now as well. Um, this is what they call a waveline flute. I don't have a waveline flute, but the concept is um, really interesting where you have a, a kind of a loop, a wave in the middle of the flute that makes the flute uh, shorter. And um, that's another option, especially for very small students. Okay, so we've spoken a little bit already about open holes and closed holes. Um, I recommend open holes for most players, but they may be more expensive than a closed hole model um, for beginners. Closed holes are fine for all beginner players. So if you've already bought a flute with closed holes, that's fine. Um, however, most flute players upgrade to an open, open hole model once they get to the intermediate level, if they're specializing on flute. So if they're doublers, they might not necessarily do that. So have a think about what you're more likely to do. Um, I actually prefer open holes for beginners as well because I think it helps with um, the hand positioning and I think the transition from uh, the beginner model flutes to the intermediate intermediate flute is much easier. That's just my, my opinion. Um, that's an error which other flute teachers may disagree with and that's, that's fine. Um, some people will say definitely get the closed hole model. Um, to me, it makes sense to have the open hole model from the beginning. Okay, so then you've got the option of an offset or an inline G and then a split E key. All right, so the offset key I'm just going to show you what that means. Again, in Australia here, I think most people are playing on offset. So if you have a look at the mechanism, okay, you'll notice that these, this key here is slightly offset. So you've got three keys in line and then you've got this key which is offset so that makes it a little bit more comfortable to play it means you don't have to stretch quite as far whereas an inline model all of those keys are directly in line with each other so um, the inline model might be more suitable for some players for example a man with large um, hands and fingers might actually um, uh, prefer to play with that inline model and there are various players around the world that 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 play on inline uh, generally speaking though I think especially if someone has small hands small to medium hands I would strongly recommend getting the offset um, uh, the offset key it means that you don't have to stretch quite so far in my doctoral studies um, we did a scientific research project where uh, we actually um, had one player one of the players was quite small and she was playing an inline model and it was quite a stretch for her to to get this finger to the g key so uh, I think that made a difference to her and that she would have been better off with an offset model. So that's something to consider. But in a lot of cases, um, at least here in Australia, a lot of the flutes are offset anyway. So um, uh, most players choose split E key as it makes the E's easier to play and they're more stable. So um, go for offset G and 
split E. Okay, so my recommendations overall would be for adult beginners to get a standard concert flute with a C foot joint uh, with open holes. Um, for intermediate level players, uh, a standard concert flute with a B foot joint. So with a B foot joint, it allows you to play down to low B, which you'll find in some of the orchestral repertoire and also in some of the solo flute repertoire but it also gives you a bit of extra resonance as well because of the extra length of the tubing that you have and for child beginners i recommend a standard concert flute with a c foot joint um, and as i said before some children may benefit from an introductory period uh, on yamaha fife or recorder and these can be alternated during their lessons um, and also their practice time if the child is finding the playing a bit tiring. Um, if you have a flute teacher uh, or it's a good idea to find uh, an experienced flute teacher and they can have a look at your own individual situation and give you advice based on your um, uh, what they see the size of your hands and so on so it's a really great idea to talk to somebody who is a specialist on the instrument before buying an instrument if you can okay so looking at the foot joints which foot joint should I choose the C foot the B foot or the D foot um, the C foot is standard on beginner flutes and some professional flute players also use C foot joints. So when I was living in Germany, quite a lot of players still played on C, C foots. Um, but it means that you can't play down to the low B. Um, uh, well, there are ways of doing it, of bending the note down, but um, it's much more common to have a B foot joint um, from the intermediate standard uh, up to professional level. And it means that you can play down to the B below middle C. Um, the B foot slightly longer, as we've seen in the pictures. Um, and the D foot's an all-in-one body uh, as, uh, for example, that very first small flute that you saw with the curved head joint. It doesn't have a separate foot joint. So let's say you had a very young child, like um, seven years old, who really, really wanted to play flute, but they're quite small. Um, to be honest with you, I'd recommend that you choose the Yamaha 5. But if you really, really want to play a flute, then this D foot flute is a great idea. But the disadvantage is when they do grow up and get bigger, then they're going to want to play the low C and C sharp and it's not possible to play on that flute. So then that's the time where you'll need to upgrade. So um, it is, uh, you have to weigh up these different options. Okay, and to finish off, I have a special treat. I'm just going to stop the video and warm up my flute and come back and play. <laughs>
Thank you so much for listening. Huge thanks to Karen, Angelina, and the Community Engagement Services Department um, of the State Library of Sarawak for creating this fantastic opportunity. Have fun with your flute, fife, and recorder playing. Thank you.